if I don't know what was dislocated, the aftercare that I have to go through is dramatically different. So if he comes in with his foot at 60 to 90 degrees relative to his leg, yes, something is wrong, but we don't know what. The ankle joint is right here. The subtalar joint is right here. It is much more common to have a subtalar dislocation, so that joint between the talus and the calcaneus, than it is to have an ankle dislocation. Additionally, a subtalar joint dislocation is essentially inherently stable once it's reduced and rarely needs to go on to surgery. An ankle dislocation, while being rare, is a much bigger deal because you have potentially destabilized the entire lateral ankle complex and your syndesmosis, and that has a decent chance of needing surgical repair. I find the anterior tibial tendon. There's a soft spot right between, which I handily marked with an X. If the patient is an extremis, we've got blue toes, we've got gushing blood, some type of crazy extreme situation. Easy answer, put the foot underneath the leg. If the foot's over here, bring it this way to go under the leg. If the foot's over here, bring it this way to go under the leg. Generally, the easiest way to do this, because the gastroc starts up in the thigh, above the knee and attaches at the heel, your Achilles tends to be your enemy in reducing an ankle or foot injury. So the easiest thing to do is have another person stand next to the patient and have that other person bend the knee up that takes the tension off the gastroc. And then you wanna get traction. So you wanna traction that foot and then get it back to where it needs to sit. The vast majority of ankle fractures are a supination external rotation type, and a lot of them will benefit from a Quigley maneuver. So a Quigley maneuver is basically grabbing the toe and hanging the foot, which brings the foot into inversion. There is a nice way to do this with limited assistance. I have personally done it in my clinic during a busy clinic day, so you know that it can be done. So you want to get a stockinette because your stockinette is going to be your assistant. Now remember we said basically by pulling on the big toe, we bring that foot into inversion. So if we get the stockinette and we have an IV pole, what we can do is basically hang the patient in Quigley maneuver. And if you are shorter, you can start by tying it and then cranking up the IV pole. And depending, we can actually bring the pole over so it would stand here and that actually bends the knee up a little bit better. But you can see that the foot is being pulled into inversion. So from this position, you can have your splint ready to go and then you can just hold it without having to have 13 different hands. You're still gonna want one assistant to kind of hold your plaster in place as you wrap the ace wrap around it. We have our 10 thick plaster. I'm gonna have this laid out on a table or a bed. And then rather than wrap the patient, I'm gonna put this right on the plaster. You wanna cover your plaster and go out across the edges so that your plaster is not gonna slide on your cast padding. And I like to put three to four layers of cast padding 
on my plaster. And you can see I'm doing two because the plaster is five inches thick, the web roll is six inches thick, that's not enough border on each side. So now I've got my plaster and my padding. The padding is wider than my plaster. I've got my water ready to go, and then I'm gonna make sure I have everything else I need. I've got my two ace wraps. And then what's nice to do with putting a splint on is have another layer of web roll ready to go to go over the plaster so that the ace wrap doesn't stick to the plaster. This is nice when you get the phone calls from home because they're worried that the ace wrap is too tight, but you don't want to let them take it off because that's what's holding your splint together. So they can loosen this a little bit without having it pulling off the splint. So I have the patient in the right position. I've got my plaster on my web roll laid out. I've got my ace wraps ready to go. I've got a handy dandy assistant. So you've got your plaster. Easiest way to make this simple and clean and neat and really sweet. Have it, that's your stack of 10, fold it in half. Go to your warm water, dip, accordion it. Squeeze it out. I've still got my finger in between the two ends. Then I'm going to grab one end, lift it up, sluice out the extra water between my two fingers. Plus, playing with plaster is actually kind of fun. Got my plaster here. I'm going to lay it on my pre made web roll. I'm going to fold that over so it's all ready to go. I'm gonna get that extra piece, lay it over my plaster. So I've got my plaster ready to go. I've got my assistant. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have her hold this in place. I'm going to do my ace wrap now. Now this piece doesn't need to be pretty in the fracture setting because you want the splint functional, not particularly pretty. Pretty is not your key interest here. That being said, you don't want big wrinkles against the skin of the patient, which is why I tend to do it this way rather than wrap the web roll on the patient first. We've now got the splint on. It's still wet. We can mold. And now I'm going to come in and hold that inversion. So you want a hand above the fracture, a hand below the fracture on the foot, and then I can basically rest the heel on my chest and hold it until it gets warm and firm. Ninety degrees is not essential in the acute fracture setting. You want to be close to ninety. So in that scenario, what I can do is basically I'm pushing up on his toes with my shoulder. In the isolated lateral malfracture, I think yes. Being as close to 90 as you can is important. Um, I'm probably a little bit below 90, and I'm obviously inverting this patient quite a bit. So I, this is where I differ from many of my colleagues. I think the key, depending on the fracture pattern, if you have displacement on the AP view and your lateral view shows that there's no posterior malfracture, the talus is not out the front or the back, this is the key piece. So you can do this, and then once you're done, you can add a posterior slab to give additional stability if you want. I actually tend in all of my patients to just do a sugar tongue. I would say this is the most important piece. Mm -hmm. So getting this right and getting the position right, and then you can go back and add a posterior slab. You can just put it over, um, or you can do a smaller ace wrap and then do it over the top. Okay. Um, I would say in my training, several of my colleagues did one and then wrapped and then did the second. I think whatever you can do that gets you the ability to get right to the molding of the fracture, which is the key piece, mm -hmm. um, and you can do it easily and consistently is what you should go with. The thing to be aware of, 
with a posterior slab is that that's going to go around your heel. You want to make sure that you've got adequate padding at the heel because a lot of patients will come in with a, a sore on their heel. And we'll untie him here. The other thing to be aware of with a sugar tong is where is that sugar tong ending? So you can see, and we'll cut it back with the scissors. Here is his fifth monotarsal head. That fifth monotarsal head and the fifth toe can become your enemy in a sugar tong that's too far down the foot. And it wants to slide. So I've got my sugar tong kind of midfoot and ankle, and the forefoot is free. Um, that's going to give protection to these metatarsal heads. Your sugar tongue can be a little bit further down, that's okay, but you want to make sure there's no pressure over here. And a lot of these won't have the stockinette underneath because you're not going to need that because you've got extra hands. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to make sure that you're not doing this to the toes because that can cause ulcerations. So as your friendly foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon, who will be wanting to fix this ankle. Please, when you dismiss this patient from urgent care, ER, your clinic, remind them to elevate, elevate, elevate. Elevate higher than the heart for as much of the day as possible until they see the surgeon so that we can get that surgery done quicker and have them faster onto the road to recovery. Another thing I have learned actually from my patients, it's very difficult to feel like ice is getting through your splint. Elevate that foot on multiple pillows, couch cushions, even like a suitcase with a pillow on top, and then ice bag behind the knee. That'll cool the blood as it goes down the leg and proves really effective for a lot of patients.